Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. None of us particularly likes reruns. We tend to pay less than perfect attention when a point is being rehashed. Forgive me for repeating myself, but we really recoil from reiterations of recently recited returns. Nevertheless, there's not only a time for everything, but there's another time for everything or a time for everything again. Consider for a moment the subject of revival. Understood literally, revival means new life. In order for there to be new life, there first must be old life. It is not merely to make life, but to remake it. One cannot have life again without having life first. And there's only one source for life, whether old life or new life. Theologians make a distinction between what we call the ontological trinity pertaining to the being of the Trinity, and the economic Trinity pertaining to the work of the Trinity. In the former, we affirm that each of the members of the Trinity is equal to the others in power and glory. They are the same in substance. There is nothing you can predicate about one member of the Trinity that you cannot predicate about the others. The Father is, for instance, no more sovereign than the Son. The Son is no more loving than the Father, and the Spirit is no more omnipresent than either of them. When we speak of the economic Trinity, however, we're speaking specifically about the calling or roles of each of the members of the Trinity. It is the Father who elects, and not the Son. It is the Son, and not the Father, that is incarnate. It is the Spirit, and not the Father or the Son, who regenerates the souls of the elect. It is the Father and the Son who send the Spirit, not the other way around. There is some overlap in the economic trinity, activities that all three members participate in, in one way or another. And uh, I, I suspect that this is made most clear in the creation itself. The word of God begins with these pregnant words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 1. We all have a tendency, I think, to think that in the creation, it was God the Father who served as the creator. There's truth in that but not in such a way as to exclude the Son and the Spirit. In John's Gospel, we are reminded, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. John 1, 3. Back in Genesis 1, we see also the Spirit's activity. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Genesis 1-2 The Spirit of God is 
active, taking that which is formless and giving it form, that which is void and bringing forth fruit. The Psalms likewise speak of the Spirit as the giver of life to the plants of the field. It is perhaps for this reason that when the Nicene Creed speaks of the Spirit, it affirms, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. There is life in the Spirit. The Spirit, just as with the Father and the Son, however, was not finished with his work at the end of the creation. The fall, we know, brought death to the creation, and most powerfully and pitifully into man. It is the spirit who takes that which was alive and became dead and revives that spirit in his work of regeneration. Revival, then, is principally a work of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture tells us that the spirit brings revival when and where he will. The Apostle John writes, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from. And where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John 3, 5 through 8. This is, of course, Jesus. He is speaking to Nicodemus, and he is speaking in the clearest possible terms about the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit preceding faith. He reminds this teacher of the law that the flesh profits nothing. It is the Spirit who gives life. Our understanding of the sovereignty of God in regeneration must then drive our understanding of the sovereignty of God in revival. We cannot at the same time affirm that the Spirit is that which gives life, and affirm that we can bring revival to pass through human effort. Jesus takes great pains to put to rest the notion that we can even plan for revival, or seek to harness it in some way. The Spirit, like the wind, blows where it will. Now, to be sure, faith comes by hearing. I'm not here advocating a kind of hyper-Calvinism that would be silent in the pronouncing and the proclaiming of the good news. God works through and ordains means to accomplish his ends. I am, however, advocating for true Calvinism, in which we affirm our utter and absolute dependence upon the power of God, and in this instance, our inability to predict the weather patterns of the work of the Spirit. We are called to proclaim the gospel boldly, faithfully, and accurately but we are to do so with all humility dependent upon the spirit that gives life. Revival, friends, is not something we do to ourselves. Nor is revival something the revivalist does to or for us. It is not something we schedule. 
It's not even something with which we cooperate. To even think otherwise is to claim the power of the wind and to offend the Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, is the Lord and giver of life. If we want revival, and we do, our only calling is to pray with fervor that the wind would blow. Our only option is to concede that we have no options, that the wind will blow where it will. Our only hope is in the Lord and giver of new life, that he would be pleased to hover over the preaching of the word and make it not void, but fruitful. And when he does, our only response is this. Non nobis domine. Not unto us, O Lord, but unto thee be the glory. There is a season for the wind to play. Pray that it will come soon. We are winding our way near to the end of the Old Testament, not quite there, uh, in our ongoing series, The Bible in Five Minutes. And today we come to the prophet Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I. Haggai was a prophet uh, who served God's people in Judah uh, during the time of the return from the exile. We're given a clue as to that time frame as a reference is made to the second year of King Darius. And we know quite a bit about what was going on during this time frame because of all that is contained in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Oh, but, or excuse me, Haggai has a, a special closer connection to Ezra because while Nehemiah's focus is on repairing the walls around Jerusalem, Ezra's focus is on the repairing and restoring and rebuilding of the temple, uh, which is also what Haggai is all about. Uh, he is, uh, interestingly, given virtually no background. We don't know who his father is. We don't know necessarily where he was born. So there's some level of mystery uh, about him. But his message is not especially esoteric or difficult to grasp. Rather, uh, his message was an, an interesting combination of the affirmation of the responsibility of God's people both to do the work that God had given them to do and to have their hearts committed to him. Both of those matched up with a strong affirmation of God's sovereign authority and power. I think there's something like 38 verses in the book of Haggai. And in those 38 vo verses, 14 different times, God is referred to as the Lord of hosts. Now, you may not know what that term means. It's not that complicated. The Lord of hosts simply means Lord of the hosts of angels, the one who is over all the heavenly host. Uh, that's what Lord Sabaoth, S-A-B-A-O-T-H, means. It's not Lord of the Sabbath. It's Lord of the hosts. And that's what God is. So God is, at the one and the same time, affirming his absolute power, 
but also saying, hey, that doesn't mean that you can sit back uh, and uh, rest on your laurels and just watch while I do everything. I want you to be busy about the work of restoring this temple. And one of the reasons for that is that it's important for our relationship. You know, the temple wasn't a prize. It wasn't a uh, a uh, commendation to God's people. None of God's relationship with his people was given as a commendation. He's always quick to remind them, you're a stiff-necked people. I didn't choose you because you're the best. I didn't choose you because you're the strongest or the biggest. I chose you to make my name known. But the temple is that place by which God continues to renew covenant with his people. You understand that when God's people would bring their sacrifices to the temple, when they would come to Jerusalem and the temple for the annual festivals there, uh, that this was a form of covenant renewal. It's not a new covenant. It's not that the covenant expires. It's actually a reminder of the covenant that already exists. And so they're coming and they're renewing covenant, and but they need the temple they did to be able to do that. We, however, are blessed to live in a time where we meet God wherever we are. We still need to renew covenant. It's one of the reasons why uh, I am an uh, eager and uh, vocal uh, proponent of the importance and value of celebrating the Lord's Supper each and every week. That's something that we do at uh, Sovereign Grace Fellowship. It's something that we, I have done at every church I've ever served at. Uh, I think it's vitally important because I, th I think whether it is the Old Testament temple sacrifice system or the Lord's Supper, in both instances, we have recreated for us the truth of our sin, Christ's provision, and God's assurance of his love for us. All of that then is is contained in this book of Haggai. This prophet is calling God's people to, to get to work, to be diligent. He's reminding them that God is in control. He's reminding them of the importance of the temple. But all of that built around, you need to know, children of Israel, now that you've come back from the exile, you need to know God is at work. God is reestablishing you. God is putting uh, Zerubbabel in place. He is remaking what he took from you. These are the good days. So rejoice, give thanks, draw near, rest in his sovereignty, but also out of that rest, work. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproulgr.com. And join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.